Hi, my name is Jamie T. Van. I'm Chief Scientist of Microsoft's Experiences and Devices and responsible for bringing research to the core Microsoft products that you use every day to get things done. Welcome to the Amplifying Human Productivity and Creativity track of Microsoft Research Summit 2022, where experts from across disciplines will explore how tech can give people the freedom and the flexibility to be their most creative and productive selves. That's obviously a really important topic here at Microsoft and something I've explored through my own research for decades. Not because I'm particularly creative myself, but because with four kids and a career and a life, I really wanna figure out how technology can help me focus on the things that are meaningful to me. You know, as humans, we always wanna do more. We wanna do more in a day. We wanna more friends. We want more success. We even want more of the activities that we do when we're just messing around. And technology can sometimes exacerbate this. Things like notifications and updates and recommendations can make us feel like we're not doing enough. But the opportunity, the real goal for technology is to, for us to achieve more of what actually matters. The past few years have really challenged us to reimagine how we live and how we work, and it's brought into sharp focus what technology can enable. Millions of people around the world, for example, were able to shift to remote work almost overnight because of technology. People were able to hang out with their friends while minimizing the spread of COVID because of technology. And this rapid digital transformation means that there are new entry points and new data for us to continue imagining. But there's also a ton of uncertainty right now. We don't, for example, fully understand how this rapid digital transformation will impact people or organizations or society. Fortunately, research is a tool for making sense of uncertainty. And with today's sessions, we hope to highlight how research can help realize technology's potential as an amplifier of human potential. For example, billions of people play video games every year. So we've invited leaders from the gaming industry to talk about how AI is changing gaming. Another thing that many of us try to do, but don't always succeed at, is communicate with visual content instead of just text. So we've organized a series of talks demonstrating how AI can now democratize the creation of videos and images. And we wrap up the track by looking at some of the ways to bridge the gap between humans and technology be it by bringing common sense knowledge into AI systems, or by bringing people's innate spatial intelligence into remote collaboration tools via the metaverse. But to kick us off, we're gonna start by examining how technology can empower mathematicians. Mathematical problems are increasingly complex, and this creates all sorts of challenges. Mathematical proofs, for example, are likewise increasingly complex. They're hard to read and understand, and this makes them hard to referee or cite. It also makes collaboration difficult, and it limits engagement to small academic groups. But imagine the advancements that could be made if collaborating around proofs were easier. In the upcoming session, you'll learn about a computer-based proof assistant from Microsoft Research called Lean. Lean helps people provide new results through formal mathematics which is also known as machine checkable mathematics. With Lean, people at all levels of math, not just established mathematicians, but students as well, can contribute to the field's most important questions without having to worry about making mistakes. In just a moment, Microsoft senior principal researcher, Leonardo de Mora, professor of philosophy and mathematical sciences at Carnegie Mellon University, Jeremy Avogad, and assistant professor of mathematics at Fordham University, Heather Macbeth, will provide an overview of Lean. Stay tuned to hear how Lean is fueling a digital revolution in mathematics research and get a glimpse into what mathematics education could look like in the future. Thanks for joining us today and enjoy the track. Hi, I'm Leo Jimura, a Senior Principal Researcher at Microsoft. Today, I'm going to tell you how we are empowering mathematicians with technology. We have an exciting session I will begin introducing the Augmented Mathematical Intelligence Project, AMI for short. We are revolutionizing how math is done and taught. 
You are empowering mathematicians and students to navigate complex ideas and prove theorems, new results beyond the cognitive capabilities. Then, Professor Jeremy Avigad from CMU will tell you more about this digital revolution that's happening today in mathematics. Then, Professor Heather Macbeth from Fordham University will show, you demonstrate how computers can assist you in solving mathematical problems. Math Today is hard to referee, seldom read and cited. Cross collaboration is a challenge. The problem is the trust. We say there is a trust bottleneck. To collaborate, we need to trust each other. If you prove something, I need to check your proof. It is extremely hard sometimes, or I have to trust it. And the trust is not just between humans. We are starting to see AI that can synthesize codes and proofs. And how do we trust these artifacts? It's an issue. Our mission is to democratize mathematics. Our key idea is to use to have machine checkable mathematics, also known as formal mathematics. We have a precise core language, an assembly language for mathematics, and a small trust worth program that can check proofs written in this language. Small here is important, right? We want this, this program is part of our trust code base. We want it to be easy to check and inspect. We say this is the ultimate democratizer because now the things you say should not be taken on faith or authority. It doesn't matter who you are. If your proof can be checked, the whole world can build on top of it. It is addressing the trust bottleneck. We are betting the next wave of mathematicians will migrate to formal mathematics. AMI has three pillars. The first one is math education. Many of us learn to program by playing with computers, using interpreters, compilers, following tutorials. We had these virtual playgrounds. AMI is the same playground for mathematics. The second pillar, in the second pillar, we are empowering mathematicians working on cutting edge mathematics. Professor Avigad will tell you how the community assisted a Fields medalist ensuring his new result was correct. And more than that, they managed to simplify the proof. This is remarkable, right? They simplified the proof using computer assistance. And Keep in mind that the Fields Medal is the Nobel Prize for Mathematics. In the third pillar, we see AMI as a platform for developing artificial intelligence for mathematics. The foundation of AMI is the Lintium Prover. We have been building this system for years. It's an interactive development environment for mathematics. Here we have an example in VS Code, the favorite, favorite editor of the math community. Here the user is proving a, a theorem, the infinite prime numbers, right? Uh, we have, we, we, in Visual Studio Code, you have all the tools you would expect in this kind of environment. You have IntelliSense for mathematics. You have auto-completion. You can jump to definitions. You can inspect. The system will help you to fill your proof. Let's see the, the statement of the theorem in the first line. It says that for all natural numbers, there is a natural number P that's greater than or equal to N, and P is also a prime number. What follows is the proof an argument, evidence that this statement is correct and what it's checked by the system. It looks like code. This is not a coincidence. In Lean, proofs can be viewed as programs and this is a powerful idea. You can learn more about Lean on our website. You'll find instructions on how to install Lean on your machine, tutorials, links to popular science magazines talking about Lean, podcasts, and YouTube videos. The power of the community. The Lean Mathematical Library has more than 1 million lines of formal mathematics. It's remarkable. It has contributions from more than 250 people. 
Mathlib is an open source project managed by the community. Here we have their GitHub repository. You can see they have merged more than 15,000 pull requests. And there are more than 500 in the queue to be merged. And more coming every single day. We're enabling this community of something we call decentralized collaboration. There are two ingredients, metaprogramming and formal proofs. What's metaprogramming? Is the ability of extend Lean using Lean itself. Lean is a language for writing mathematical definitions and theorems, but it's also a great and powerful programming language. Mathematicians use it all the time to extend the system. They write their own proof automation. Here we have an example, the ring theory solver that's part of Mathlib. This is just a snippet of the static that was written by the community. We call this kind of proof automation tactics, and Professor Macbeth will show you many examples later in this session and show how they can assist you in making you more productive and, solve mathemat and solving mathematical problems. Metaprogram is not just useful for automating proofs. You can also build visualization tools, your own notation. You can generalize results. You can treat math as data. In formal proofs, they address the trust bottleneck. You don't need to trust me to use my proofs. You don't need to trust my proof automation to use it. If there is a bug in my proof automation, our trusted proof checker will catch the mistake. You can hack without fear of making mistakes. But should you trust Lean? This is a recurrent question we get, right? Lean is a big program. It may it has bugs as every single big program, right? But it has a small trusted proof checker. It's a small piece of code that you can inspect and make sure it is correct. Do I need to trust it? No, you can export your proofs, your definitions, and check them with external checkers. The community has implemented many of them, and you can implement your own if you want. It's a fun project. These checkers are not big pieces of code, right? It's feasible to implement one in one week. Formal mathematics is changing. It's having a huge impact in the area right now, but there are many challenges ahead. Modern math proofs are complex and massive objects, and the community is pushing the limits every single day. We need innovations in core algorithms, data structures, and to improving to be able to handle this complexity. We also create a new area that intersects computer science and math, and we need innovations in programming language design, and there are interesting conversations happening right now between computer scientists and mathematicians. We also want to make the system more accessible. There are high school students using Lean right now, but we want many more. We want students that don't have access to proper math education, to have a way to learn it, to use this virtual playground to learn math by themselves. Finally, we believe AI offers a huge huge opportunity for empowering math users. But we need innovations here too. We need AI that can generate these machine checkable semantic objects. Before we finish the first part of our session, I want to emphasize formal mathematics is not just about trust. It also enables many new exciting possibilities. We can define objects using Lean. Right? We can define commutative diagrams. But it's not only that, you can also define visualizations. You can write programs in Lean that allow you to visualize these objects. And after you do that, you can see them. When you are in the middle of a proof or in the middle of a definition, Visual Studio Code will show you. Right. This is a very powerful idea. You can write your own visualizations and it will help the whole community to understand the proofs better, to understand their definitions and navigate these thick jungles that people find in advanced mathematics. 
we also we can also use lint to generalize and refactor results automatically. Here we have a mathematician, Ricardo, celebrating on Zulip the fact that a new term can be automatically generalized. He is treating math as data that can be manipulated, transformed, generalized. Not only they can generalize a result automatically, they can propagate this fact to every single result that depends on this theorem. And he points out how crazy it would be to do that in informal math. Imagine getting an old paper and trying to track all the papers that depend on this one when you generalize it. I want to invite you to join Zulip. Go there. You will find mathematicians, computer scientists, fields medalists, students all working together. It's a great place. Finally, formal mathematics enable AI not just because it addresses the trust bottleneck. We also have this formal language that we can feed to these big language models that are so popular today in machine learning. I'm going to show you LinChat, a tool developed by Zanjir Azerbaev and Eduard Ayers. It's available on the VS Code marketplace. It's there, you can download it and use it. It allows you to write statements in English, right? mathematical statements in English, and it will convert into Lean. Right? This is super useful. It, it helps you to learn Lean by using English, using the language you have in a math text, a regular math paper, and you can try to translate it automatically to Lean. And you can ask Lean Chat to make corrections. Lean Chat is based on Codex the same codex that powers the GitHub Copilot tool that is so popular today. Thank you very much for your attention. Please go to our website, you'll find many links there, and follow us on Twitter. You can find us on Zulip, GitHub, and watch our videos on YouTube. Thank you very much. Thanks, Leo. Uh, I'm Jeremy Avigad from Carnegie Mellon University, and it's a pleasure being able to talk to you today about the digital revolution in mathematics. So as you uh, will have gathered from Leo's talk, uh, you know, you can think of Lean in a number of different ways. Uh, for one thing, it's a theorem prover, uh, which is to say it's a platform for defining mathematical objects, stating theorems, and writing complex proofs. Uh, it's also a performant functional programming language, uh, which uh, provides means for writing specifications and uh, proving that your programs satisfy them. Uh, each of these would be interesting and important in its own right, but bringing them together is especially powerful for mathematics because it uh, allows us to apply computational methods to mathematical reasoning and conversely um, to apply mathematical reasoning to computation. Uh, Lean is based on a technology, uh, a, a, a body of technology known as formal methods in computer science, which are logic-based computational methods for specifying and verifying software and hardware. Um, the interesting thing is that until recently, um, these methods did not have a big impact in the mathematical community. Um, very few mathematicians were using proof assistance. Uh, and then in, in 2017, a number of mathematicians discovered Lean and the Lean community was born. And so on this slide, uh, I'm showing you a picture of the Lean community web pages, which you are free to uh, check out uh, and explore. Um, and lots of, of things have happened since then. So, you know, by now, hundreds of people have contributed to Lean's library, which is affectionately known as MathLib. Uh, the library has almost a million lines of formal definitions, theorems, and proofs. Uh, Lean has a social media channel on Zulip, which gets hundreds of messages uh, every day. Um, and there are a growing number of papers, conferences, and workshops that are dedicated to formalization of mathematics uh, and Lean. Um, and so here you can see from the community web pages, you can see uh, some of the MathLib statistics uh, and uh, the, 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 the way the library has been growing. Uh, and here's a snapshot of the Lean Zulip channel. Um, and again, anybody's welcome to join, drop in, uh, listen into the conversations, uh, introduce themselves and say hi. So I encourage you to do that. Um, and by now there have been you know, far too many notable achievements for me to, to survey, but just to mention a few of them, uh, Jesse Hahn and Floris Van Dorn gave the first formal verification of the independence of the continuum hypothesis uh, in Lean, uh, and that's a, a major result in set theory. 
Uh, Johan Komelin led the liquid tensor experiment, which was uh, a, a response to a challenge by Fields medalist Peter Schulze, who asked whether anyone could verify some of his recent uh, uh, work uh, with Dustin Clausen. Um, and then very recently, Bavik Mehta and uh, Thomas Bloom verified an important result in number theory. Um, and the situation is summed up nicely uh, by, uh, by a uh, quote from a blog post that Schulze wrote about the liquid tensor experiment. Uh, he said, I find it absolutely insane that interactive proof assistants are now at the level that within a very reasonable time span, they can formally verify difficult original research. Uh, Lean has been getting uh, a lot of good press with articles uh, in places like Quanta and Nature. Uh, so, you know, titles like uh, in Quanta, Building the Mathematical Library of the Future, uh, or the one in Nature, Mathematicians Welcome Computer Assisted Proof in Grand Unification Theory. Um, and every four years, uh, there is the International Congress of Mathematicians, uh, which is the big conference at which the, the new fields medalists uh, are announced. Uh, and at the, at the most recent one in July, Kevin Buzzard gave a talk uh, on the rise of formalism in mathematics, which was dedicated to lean and, and, uh, the, uh, and formalization and the new technology. And amidst all this excitement in September of 2021, uh, here at Carnegie Mellon, we launched the Charles C. Hoskinson Center for formal mathematics made possible by a gift by Charles Hoskinson. And the center is dedicated to the use of formal computational methods in mathematical research and education. And just about everything we do is, is based on lean. And so on this slide, I'm showing you a, a picture of the, of the center web pages. So I hope I've, I've managed to convey that there's really a lot of excitement around formal methods in lean right now. Um, to the point where some are even calling it the start of a revolution in mathematics. And so, you know, given all that hype and all that excitement, it's reasonable to ask, you know, is it, is it, is it warranted, right? So why all the excitement? Uh, and so that's what this talk is about. Uh, so I've already told you about lean and formal methods in mathematics. I'm gonna step back a minute and think about uh, mathematical revolutions more broadly. Uh, and then I'm gonna come back and make the case that this really is the start of a, of a digital revolution in mathematics. So when historians talk about mathematical revolutions, they typically have things in mind like the appearance of deductive reasoning in ancient Greece, or the rise of algebraic methods, or the birth of calculus, uh, or the use of infinitary reasoning in the 19th century, or uh, in the 20th century, the advent of the computer and numeric uh, computation. Um, and so let me just focus on, on one of these examples. Um, so what we think of today as essentially being high school algebra uh, has its roots in the work of al khwarizmi in the ninth century uh, and even earlier in ancient Greece. But a real turning point for algebra occurred in the 17th century. And it was a matter of uh, a number of things coming together. Uh, I mean, one was just the development of better algebraic notation and symbolization. Um, another thing that happened around then was the uh, increasing mathematization of natural science. Uh, and, uh, and finally, there was the use of algebraic methods to solve problems in geometry and science. Right. And just to give you examples of these, uh, you know, on this slide, I've, uh, I've listed uh, uh, Cardano, I've quoted Cardano's solution to the cubic equation in 1545. Um, I'm not going to read it. It's kind of a wordy, you know, it's a rambling wordy mess. Um, but it's what we would express by the uh, formula um, on the bottom. Okay. And this, you know, this, these advances occurred later in the century with Fayette and the uh, following century with Descartes. Uh, so, you know, one thing that happened was that notation and symbolism just became more efficient and, and more manageable. Um, as far as the mathematization of science, um, there's a famous quote by Galileo um, from 1623, uh, that philosophy is written in this grand book, I mean the universe, which stands continually open to our gaze. And I should note that uh, by philosophy, um, so natural philosophy is what people called natural science back then. Um, and Galileo goes on, uh, it cannot be understood unless one first learns to comprehend the language and interpret the characters in which it is written. It is written in the language of mathematics. So Galileo is telling us that if you want to do science, right, you have to speak the language of mathematics. Okay. And finally, uh, uh, a big turning point in the development of algebraic methods was a book called The Geometry by Descartes. Uh, which first showed how to use algebraic methods to solve difficult problems in geometry. Um, and uh, uh, the key idea comes on the second page, where he says, often it's not necessary to draw the lines on paper, 
but it is sufficient to des designate each by a single letter. Uh, thus, to add the lines B, D, and G, H, I call one A and the other B and write A plus B and so on. So the idea is if you want to solve a geometric problem, you label things in the diagram with variables, with letters, you write down equations, you solve the equations, and that gives you a solution to the geometric problem. Right? And that was a really strikingly new idea um, at the time. So what this illustrates, I mean, this is kind of typical for other mathematical revolutions, is a few things. So first of all, mathematical revolutions don't happen all at once. This is kind of a gradual, uh, uh, you know, confluence of ideas uh, that, that comes together, um, and then there's, there's a dramatic change. Um, and also, they're not revolutions in the sense of overthrowing the old order. Um, Descartes wasn't trying to replace Euclidean geometry. Rather, he was presenting better methods for solving geometric problems in the Euclidean tradition. So revolutions tend to incorporate the past and build on it rather than reject it. Right? But what makes them so dramatic is that they open up new capacities for, for thought. So after, after a change like this, problems that were hard to solve before become easier to solve, and problems that were just in, out of reach before suddenly become solvable. Okay? And not only that, uh, but with the new ideas and new methods, typically new questions arise and new problems. Um, and so in thinking about mathematical revolutions, I think it's also important to think about them in terms of what's important to mathematics. Uh, mathematics has practical applications, but, um, but most mathematicians will tell you that what we really care about is something deeper uh, and more satisfying. It's a kind of mathematical understanding. And so for that reason, what we really value are intuitions, ideas, uh, and insights. But at the same time, you know, we have to communicate these ideas and insights to one another in very precise ways. Um, and in that sense, mathematics provides really extraordinary ways for that the community can come together uh, and reason together and come to consensus as to whether a proof uh, or an argument is correct. Um, and uh, the main challenge in that respect, and especially today, is complexity. As definitions and theorems and proofs become more complicated, it becomes harder and harder to keep track of, of the information. Okay, so remember I said I was gonna talk about, uh, uh, so I've, I've told you about lean and formal methods and I've said a little bit about the nature of mathematical revolutions. So what I'd like to do now is come back and think about the new technology in, in these terms. Okay, so you know, as far as what the technology can do for us, I mean, one thing it can do is verify the correctness of a mathematical proof. So in early 2022, uh, Thomas Bloom solved a problem po posed by Paul Erdős and Ronald Graham. Uh, it was a big deal. The headline in Quanta read, math's oldest problem ever gets a new answer. Uh, and within a few months, uh, Bloom and Bavik Mehta verified the correctness of the proof in Lean. Um, and on this slide, I'm showing you a tweet by Kevin Buzzard, where he says he's happy to report that Bloom went on to learn Lean and, you know, with Bavik Mehta, formalized the proof. Uh, and then Fields medalist Timothy Gowers uh, uh, responds that he's very excited that Thomas Bloom and Bavik Mehta have done this. He says, I think it's the first time that a serious contemporary result in mainstream mathematics doesn't have to be checked by a referee because it has been checked formally. Maybe the sign of things to come. And this idea of verifying correctness, it also uh, plays into the blog post by Peter Schulze, uh, where he begins by saying that uh, he's excited to announce that the experiment has verified the entire part of the argument that he was unsure about. But then I think it's important to recognize that it's really not just about verifying correctness. It's really about being able to explore the ideas in precise ways. Right? And in, the, in that same blog post, Schultze goes on and says that half a year ago, I did not understand why the argument worked. But then he goes on to explain that the formalization helped him realize that the key thing happening is a reduction from a non-convex problem over the reals to a convex problem over the integers. And when a Fields medalist tells you that a formalization project helped him understand his own work better, that's something really notable and meaningful. Uh, another notable feature of the project is that it was done collaboratively, uh, and it gives a model for how di digital collaboration can happen in, in mathematics. So the formalization was kept in a shared online repository, um, and participants in the project followed an informal blueprint that was also online and had links to the repository. Uh, and kept uh, in constant contact, contact on social media. Um, and when you think about this, you know, this is kind of a recipe for chaos, like everybody you know, working on different pieces and so on. But what made it work is that Lean was there to make sure that the pieces fit together. There were formal specifications of Lean, the proofs were carried out to Lean, and by the nature of the software, they, they, it had to fit, it had to work. 
And so here I'm showing you online. You can find this online again. Here is the blueprint uh, that people were working from. And you see there's informal text, uh, but there are also links to the formal content. Uh, and if you look, you see the check marks. Um, that's, uh, those are uh, signaling that those parts of those definitions and those parts of the project were, were completed formally in Lean. Uh, we're also learning that an interactive proof assistant is a very powerful tool for teaching mathematics. So just as students can learn how to program by writing computer programs and trying them out and seeing what happens, um, as you'll see in Heather's talk, Lean empowers students to explore mathematical reasoning on their own by letting them carry out reasoning steps and get feedback right away as to, as to whether they're correct or not and what, what the consequences of their actions are. Um, and so, there, you know, in, in recent months, there have been uh, a number of workshops and conferences uh, dedicated to learning how to use the technology effectively. And on this slide, I, I just give you a, an example of one of them. So this was held in uh, Loughborough um, in April of 2022. Okay. Um, and you know, this this only scratches the surface. I mean, once you have your mathematics in digital form, um, it really opens up lots new lots of new possibilities. Um, as Leo described, uh, Lean can be used as a platform for numerical and symbolic computation, uh, as well as for automated reasoning and machine learning. And the idea is having your mathematics in the digital form allows you to to use computational tools you know, backed by precise mathematical formulations of the problems. Uh, and then at the other end, uh, interpret and, and verify the results of computation in precise mathematical terms. Okay, so in short, uh, formal technology can help us build mathematical libraries, verify results, explore new concepts, collaborate, teach mathematics, carry out mathematical computation more rigorously, and you use artificial intelligence to discover new mathematics. And the point is, these are all things that are essential. These are things that are important to mathematics. And the technology lets us do them in striking new ways. So, and that's why I think that we're really at the start of a, of a, of a revolution. And so I'd like to just close with just a, a couple more thoughts. You know, I often wonder, you know, when you look at, at the history of mathematics, whether people knew at the time that they were in the middle of a revolution. And I'd like to give you an example where I think, uh, at least in this case, the, the, the clear answer is yes. So, you know, there's there's a problem that uh, that high school students and and uh, you know freshmen in calculus classes and physics classes today, you know, are subjected to, where you know you have a projectile that's either kicked or thrown in the air or shot in the air, uh, and you're supposed to calculate the the trajectory, right? And it's a parabola. Okay. And you know, by now there are lots of textbooks out there that will tell you how to do it. I mean, as this web web page shows you, you know, you you split up the horizontal motion and the vertical motion, and you write down the equations and you solve them, and and you get the answer. The interesting thing is we happen to know historically the first person to ever solve this problem. Uh, it was Galileo. Uh, it was uh, in the year 1636. Um, and it was in a work called uh, the, uh, Two New Sciences. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, uh, at the bottom of this page here, he says, it has been observed that missiles and projectiles describe a curved path of some sort. However, no one has pointed out that the fact that this path is a parabola. But this and other facts, not few in number or, or less worth knowing, I have succeeded in proving. Right? So nobody has ever noticed, nobody ever figured out that this is a parabola, right? but I did, and I proved it. And he does. There's theorem one, proposition one in this section. A projectile, which is carried by a uniform horizontal motion compounded with a naturally accelerated vertical motion, describes a path which is a semi-parabola. And I want you to think about it. 50 years before Galileo, we couldn't even think about motion in anything other than uh, linear or circular motion. On the other hand, 50 years after Galileo, solving problems like this is absolutely routine because of the ideas and the methods that he introduced. And what we're looking at here is the transition, right? the point where the change occurred. And if there's any doubt that, that Galileo realizes that this is a big deal, you only have to look at what he says. So in the passage I quoted before, he says, but these and other facts, not few in number or less worth knowing, I've succeeded in proving. But then he goes on to say, what I consider more important, there have been opened up to this vast and most excellent science, of which my work is merely the beginning, ways and means by which other minds more acute than mine will explore its remote corners. Right? He's telling you that this is important, and he's telling you that people will be doing this long after uh, he's gone. So later in the section, he comes back and he says, so that we may say the door is now opened for the first time 
to a new method fraught with numerous and wonderful results, which in future years will command the attention of other minds. And if you can imagine what it might have been like to be a contemporary of Galileo's, reading these words for the first time and appreciating the power of the methods, you can imagine how many of us feel about using lean and formal methods to do mathematics. The technology is still young, and we don't fully understand all the things that it can do. But we see vast opportunities opening up in front of us, and we're really excited to see about what lies ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm Heather Macbeth, Assistant Professor of Mathematics at Fordham University. Jeremy has told you about the context for the formalization of logical reasoning and why we're so excited about its potential to transform how people around the world think and do mathematics. And Leo has told you about the new language lean that he and others are developing at Microsoft Research to make formalization a more powerful and accessible technology than ever. In this talk, I want to take you into the mind of someone using these technologies to think with the aid of a computer. I want to talk about what it's really like to use computer technologies like Lean to help us in all kinds of reasoning tasks, from doing a puzzle um, through to the use of it as, as a student, to the use as a mathematician, and right to the research frontier. So let's start with the kind of reasoning task that many of us are familiar with. A reasoning task for fun. Let's take ourselves to a Sunday afternoon sitting in an armchair, opening up the newspaper to a Sudoku puzzle. You might have seen this kind of puzzle before. You need to put the numbers from one to, one to nine in the empty squares of this grid in such a way that each box, each row, and each column contains each of the numbers from one to nine exactly once. The puzzles that you see in the newspaper are always arranged so that with the start that they give you, there's only one way to fill in the rest. And you can reason forward step by step about what must be in each of the missing boxes. So here's an example of what I mean. In the box that I've circled, it turns out there's only one possibility. There's a one in the row, a two in the column, a three in the column, a four in the row, a five and six in the box, a seven in the column, and a nine in the row, and what's left? Only eight. So eight has to be in the place I've circled. This is a logical deduction that I've made in my head, and it can be replicated in Lean by an appropriate tactic, as Leo has told you about. Here the tactic was written by Marcus Himmel. Um, the deduction, which I've stated as the fact that in the fourth row and second column, there must be an eight, um, is made by this kind of deduction, um, this kind of tactic the cell logic tactic implemented by Marcus. And so in the spot I've circled, there has to be an eight. That was fun, let's do it again. Now in the spot that I've circled, there's again only one possibility, thanks to what else appears in the row, column, and box. And that one remaining possibility um, is a seven. Um, so I state to lean my conclusion that in the fourth row in the first column there must be a seven by the same kind of reasoning which Marcus has called cell logic as before. And Lean takes it, it fills in the seven in the spot I've circled. And we can go on and do the same thing again. Here again there's only one possibility left, there has to be a nine in the fifth row in the second column. And Lean takes it. And one more time in the spot that I've circled, in the sixth row in first column, there has to be a four, and again, lean takes it. Now let's do a different kind of reasoning. You can see that in the box I've highlighted, all of the spots except for one are filled. Um, and so since the numbers from one to nine all appear in that particular box, um, it, the only thing that's left is two, and that has to go there. This is the chance to use a new tactic for this new kind of reasoning the full box tactic. Um, and so I can put a two in the sixth row and third column. And finally, let's, do, let's demonstrate one more kind of hum human reasoning. Here you can see that I know that there must be a five in the top left box. And yet, thanks to the other positioned fives, it can't be in the first row, nor in the first column, nor in the third column. 
And so the five in the top left box must be in the red space I've circled. This is a different kind of reasoning again, encoded by Marcus in a third tactic called box logic. And so I state my conclusion that in the third row and second column there must be a five, and Lean accepts it by updating the grid with a five. Let's do that one more time. Looking at the sixes in the top left box, I can see that the first row and the first column are both ruled out by other sixes. So again, by the box logic kind of reasoning, there must be a six in the second row and third column. And again, Lean accepts it by putting a six in that spot. So let's summarize what we've learned about reasoning in Lean. There's a visual representation of the entire logical situation that we're trying to understand, and this shows everything we've deduced so far. Each kind of reasoning that we do in hu as humans will be matched by a corresponding small lean program called a tactic. These are the ones written by Marcus called cell logic, full box, box log logic, and so on. And each time we, the human, come to a new conclusion, we can state that to lean, with the kind of reasoning that we used for it, Lean will double check that reasoning on its own, and if it's correct, it will update the visual representation. A final point, which I haven't mentioned here, is that if you are a power user and you find yourself using a particular pattern of reasoning over and over, you can write your own tactics, um, and this is what we mean by Lean being extensible, so that each kind of reasoning that you use can be reproduced by the computer. Let's switch to a different use case now, and imagine that we're a student trying to encounter algebra for the first time. We're seeing problems like this. We've got simultaneous equations x plus 3 equals 5 and 2x minus yx equals 0. And we're told to solve for y. Well, when you're a student in high school, you get problems like this over and over again, and it might take you quite a long time to learn the rules of the game that is, what kinds of things you're allowed to do in an algebra problem to manipulate it, and what kinds of things are wrong. And if you're a student in a traditional class, when you get it wrong, you might not realize for quite a long time. You might do it wrong on your homework, send it to your teacher, and hear back a week later when the, the teacher grades your homework that you had it wrong. The advantage of Lean is that you can see instantly whether you did it right or wrong with each reasoning step in your calculation. So here is the lean representation of what we know so far. There are two real numbers, x and y, and there are two facts, that x plus 3 is 5, and that 2x minus yx is 0. With each algebraic deduction that I might want to make as a student, I can type it into lean and check that my reasoning so far was correct. So for example, I can look at the first equation, that x plus 3 is 5, Substitute two from sub, sorry, subtract two from both sides, and deduce that x is two. This is in Lean encoded by the rearrangement tactic. So I tell Lean that I believe that x is two by rearranging the first fact, and Lean takes this, and Lean shows that it has accepted it by adding this fact to the info view in the list of things that have been established so far. And I can do it again. So something else I might do at this stage is to substitute the fact that x equals 2 into the equation 2x minus yx equals 0. This is a different kind of human reasoning, backed up by a different lean tactic. In this case, I type into lean that by substituting fact 3 into fact 2, 2 times 2 minus y times 2 is 0. This again is me as a student doing valid reasoning, and lean accepts it, adding that fact to the info view. Okay, let's see now what happens when our student makes a mistake. Let's say that they think, okay, I'm going to simplify this. 2 times 2 minus y times 2 is 0. Oh yes, well, 2 times 2 is 4. 2 times 2 is 2, so that simplifies to 2 minus 2y is 0. That's bad reason, because 2 times 2 is 4, not 2. So when our hypothetical student types their wrongly simplified fact, 2 minus 2y equals zero into lean, and gives the justification that they think is valid but is not, the rearrangement of fact four, lean declines to accept it. It gives an underline, and it doesn't add the fact to the info view. 
the student then, with instant feedback, can see the mistake they made, correct it, and realize that in fact two times two is four. And then they can correct what they wrote into the correct version that four minus two y is zero, and type this into lean where it's accepted. Let me briefly jump over to how this looks in lean. Here in lean, I have on the right the info view with all of the facts I've established so far, the numbers x and y, and the four equations that we were given or that we established by valid reasoning. And on the left, I have the two pieces of reasoning that I gave to lean to establish those facts so far. And as I move my cursor downwards, I can see that when as a student I made the mistake and typed in the incorrectly claimed fact that two minus two y is zero, Lean gave me a red, in, uh, red underline to indicate my error and failed to accept it in the info view. Then I'm able to correct it to the correct multiplication four minus two y equals zero and Lean accepts it again and adds that new fact to the info view. And I can go on and solve the rest of the problem by further rearrangement I can add 2y to both sides to get that 4 equals 2y. Lean accepts that. I can swap the sides of the two equations to give that 2y equals 4. And Lean takes that with a minus sign to show that there's a reversal going on. That's ex again accepted by Lean. And finally, I can divide both sides by 2 to get that y equals 2. And again, mm, Lean accepts this. And so I've reached the end of the problem with all of my errors in reasoning caught by Lean and all of my correct reasoning validated by Lean. I want to comment that although, that, that although, as far as I know, nobody is yet using Lean for this kind of use case of elementary school or high school teaching, I, people are definitely using formalization software in university teaching. And I can say from my own experience as a college professor that when students have their instant feedback given on what reasoning is correct and what is not, it really leads to a deeper understanding of what is valid and what is not in a mathematics course. Let me now go on to an example taken from my own life as a mathematician. As a mathematician, we often find ourselves reading books or articles um, that feature uses of techniques that we hope to use in a different domain, results that we might want to cite from other people's work, or new uh, areas of mathematics in which we hope to use techniques that we already understand. And in all these cases, we need to encounter the problem that when you read mathematics that's been done by other people, it can be extremely complicated. The objects that we study in modern mathematical research have layers upon layers upon layers upon layers. And even keeping track of what the objects are might require you to sketch a diagram many layers thick describing what the things are, or perhaps to refer repeatedly to an index going back in a textbook until you finally reach the page where the thing that you think that you wanted to understand is actually defined. Very little of this advanced research mathematics has been formalized so far, but when it has been, the formalization done in Lean is an invaluable tool in carrying out this kind of redirection process to find what an object really is. Here's an example I worked through with Rob Lewis at Brown, studying isocrystals, so that it doesn't really matter what an isocrystal is. We wrote this lean file as we worked out for the first time what isocrystals were in order to use the example in a paper of ours. And okay, well, what is an isocrystal? It hardly matters, but it is something that now that we have it in lean, instead of leafing through an index, we can immediately jump to the definition of. It mentions this object KPK, and I can hover over it and instantly see a tooltip giving the definition. Or back in my proof using isocrystals, here I have the ability of clicking on this, this uh, vector space involving PK and seeing, OK, well, the scalar field is this KPK. And what is this KPK? Well, it's a fraction ring of width vectors. And even if I don't immediately remember what either of these things are, I can click through to the instance definition of those things and see where it is that I learned that the width vectors are defined over here, or perhaps where it is that the, the width vectors are turned into a commutative ring over here, 
or I can also see what a fraction ring is if my memory has, has not served me. All of these things can be done instantly by clicking back and forth in the interactive view given to me by Lean. And all of these help us share the burden of thinking and remembering with the computer. In that case, I was describing mathematics that had already been done, been done by other people, in that case in the 1970s. But what we all hope is that in addition to being a wonderful tool for the understanding of research that has already been done, the formalization of mathematics in the future will aid us to actually do research mathematics at the frontier of human knowledge and understand it better as we go. Jeremy has already told you about the liquid tensor experiment, a recent achievement of a team led by Johan Kommelin, in which very recent results of the Fields Medals Peter Schulze, together with, du with Dustin Clausen, were checked in Lean only months after they were first discovered. After this experiment, Schulze described his experiences working with the team. He said that Lean was really an assistant in navigating through the proof, which he described as a thick jungle. When you're on the research frontier, often you don't know where you're going. You have a small number of facts that have been established, and you might not be able to see through to the end of what you want to prove, but you can take a few baby steps here and there. And with the help of a computer reasoning aid, you can be sure that each of those baby steps you make is correct. By formalizing the baby steps as you go, you can be confident that you're not taking two stride, strides that are too long at any given time, and you can eventually make your way to the place where you have the view of the big picture. We hope that formalization technology is going to bring this perspective to everyone as time goes on. That for all of us in the reasoning tasks we need to carry out, we'll be able to share our mental, mental load with a patient computer that helps us keep track and be sure as we go that what we're doing is correct. This is the promise that makes us all so excited and that is being realized already today. Yeah.